We've been watching the chat and seeing where everyone's coming in, seeing Tustin, Boston, Austin. Really awesome to see everybody. You know, really cool, this um, Crest Oral B series on oral systemic health. This is our fourth one, and uh, it's just been amazing. And so first, thanks to Crest Oral B for their support for the platform. And of course, to all of our panelists have been uh, amazing. And to all who are dialing in and listening in, this um one thing it just shows us the importance of oral systemic health and, and what's happening out there in dental and what the need for dental medical integration. I'll share with you um, uh, the first one we did last fall, I'm forgetting, was the highest attended uh, webinar that I've had on the Crest Oral B platform. The second one topped that, the third one topped that, and this one yet again broke their, the record. So um, it's really not about the numbers, but what it tells us who have been uh, working on this project is how really important it is and how the how well recognized it is that the mouth is actually connected to the body. I know that sounds shocking, but uh, and and how important it is for us as a society and really as, a, as humanity to how do we keep learning about it? Because people really can have maybe won't cure everything, but people sure can have better health outcomes, especially those with certain systemic conditions. Um, and the first three webinars, Tara, I saw the question. I, they are on the CE Zoom platform and you can get them. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about brain health and the link between oral health and brain health. Uh, and it's it's dramatic. And the things that we're learning um, are remarkable. And um, for anyone who has an Alzheimer's or dementia or, or, or issues like that with loved ones or in the past, you know, uh, perhaps have passed. You know, when I hear these things, I, I feel a mix of hope, but I also feel a mix of regret. I wish we knew then what we know now, and I wish we knew now what we're going to know tomorrow. So that's really where we are in our learning curve. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so thanks everyone for dialing in. We're really excited about it. I will monitor the chat. I'll be moderating today. So I will, as I am now. Hey, Lincoln, Nebraska. I see you. Uh, hi, Dr. Ho. Um, we're really happy to have you and we'll be monitoring that. And so questions I will try to keep track of. So for at the end, we will uh, have time to answer questions, uh, all the panelists. And um, but if for any reason, you know, you ask early and it seems like question period, I'm not getting to it. It could be that we <laughs> I'm getting a thousand things pinged to me. Uh, so just re-ask it if you don't mind. But I will be watching it. That would be great. Um, reminders, if you're having any issues with uh, watching right now, uh, Google Chrome is the best uh, browser to be using. So Google Chrome. Mine defaults sometimes to Explorer and that stinks. And then I go on Google Chrome, which I am now and it, everything works much better. Uh, again, chat, please participate. We'd love it. Comments, questions, you know, whatever that is. Tell me my hair looks good. I'm very sensitive, that would be great. Kidding, uh, but that would be great. We'd love to have it interactive. And for those who are looking for CE, dentists, hygienists, others, um, there will be a code that will pop up and I think it pops up in about an hour or so at the end and it will pop up on screen. So don't worry about it. You don't need to ask in the chat. We will, we want you to get your CE. So that will certainly be there. So uh, there you go. There's some house cleaning matters. I think we touched on them. Uh, so if, uh, if you'll permit me, I'll do some introductions and then we're going to jump into it. So um, first I'm Dan Burke. For those of you who uh, I haven't met yet. <laughs> Thanks Jack. I appreciate the feedback. Um, for those we haven't met, I'm the Chief Enterprise Strategy Officer here at Pacific Dental Services. I'm also serve as the Vice President of the PDS Foundation, um, which does all sorts of really amazing things. Um, I can take no credit for it, so it's not a brag. Trust me, it's just proud of it. Is uh, they have uh, the F PDS Foundation runs a clinic for special needs folks, a dental uh, clinic in Arizona. Really proud of the work they do there. Not only do they serve patients, uh, and if any of you are aware of that community, it is remarkably underserved. Uh, they do an amazing job. And also they train clinicians who are interested in serving that population. So really proud of that. Another thing the foundation does is it's the prime sponsor of uh, a very large coalition of over 150 groups who are advocating that Medicare, our nation's elderly, that Medicare be expanded to include dental care for those patients for whom it's medically necessary. and. Um, it's amazing to me in a sad way than our society. Um, and this isn't a political statement, I hope, uh, but that our nation's elderly for whom periodontal care is most 
uh, necessary, those with diabetes, brain, ish, brain health issues, uh, heart conditions, um, all of it, um, that they, they don't have dental. And we all know that if we just covered their dental, how much that would save. I mean, you probably heard of diabetes. If, if a diabetic has periodontal disease and is able to, to get it treated, uh, their uh, hospitalization rate goes down 40%, 40. Uh, they save, we save as a society anywhere from $1,400 to $4,500 per patient per year. And that's diabetics if we could get them into periodontal disease. So it makes fiscal sense and all that. And the foundation is a, is a big driver of that. And I thank the AARP, the Michael uh, J. Fox Foundation, the American Medical Association, uh, Crest Oral B, uh, uh, Invista, so many folks uh, in dental, Dental Supply Serona for supporting that initiative. Anyway, so that's that's me. Uh, and in my private life, um, I'm on the, on the Epilepsy Foundation of Orange County. So, you know, shout out for my epilepsy community. And last, uh, proud to serve on the CDC sponsored um, medical dental integrations, uh, 10 person task force where we're trying to, we're working together to see how can we accelerate the coming together of our medical system and our dental system so that they can be integrated so that all of us can be seen as a, as a single health system of one. Kind of we all have our doctor house, if you all get that reference, where, you know, you can bring together my medical, my dental records, and I can see as a whole person. Uh, so really uh, proud of that. So that's me. And let me jump into the others uh, who are, you'll hear are far more impressive than me. Uh, so first will be Dr. Stephen Masley, uh, the, who you'll meet. He's a physician, nutritionist, trained chef, author, medical researcher, and creator of the number one all-time health program for public television, 30 Days to a Younger Heart. Dr. Masley is a fellow with pre three prestigious organizations, the American Heart Association, the American College of Nutrition, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. He has a clinical appointment as a clinical association professor at the University of South Florida. Shout out to Florida. His research focuses on the impact of lifestyle choices on heart health, brain function, and aging. Dr. Masley has published several books, such as 10 Years Younger, The Better Brain Solution, The Mediterranean Method, and his latest, The 30-Day Heart Tune-Up plus numerous scientific articles. His work's been viewed by millions on PDB, PBS, the Discovery Channel, the Today Show, and over 700 media interviews. And uh, Dr. Basley, I hope it doesn't embarrass you. I have your book and it's right here on my desk and it's it's really great. And it's um, everything for a lay person. Uh, what I love is it has real practical things about nutrition and things that I can share with my parents that they can weave into their life uh, in a really seamless way. And uh, by the way, he also has a blog uh, where he has more than 50,000 folks uh, listening to him on a regular basis. So uh, I'm going to hold him off for a minute, even though by now you should be like, Dan, shut up. I want to hear from Dr. Masley. But I do want to introduce the other two panelists before I do. Uh, Dr. Katie McCann uh, is a practicing dentist, educator, mentor, coach. She lives in Aurora, Colorado. I visited her practice just this past Monday. Dr. McCann Lee graduated from University of Illinois in Chicago in 2010, and she is a partner in over 80 Pacific Dental Services supported dental practices throughout the United States. Her passion on the oral systemic link comes from her personal experience. Dr. McCann Lee was involved in an AT ATV accident as a teenager, which left her without many teeth and rendered her jaw immobile. She shared uh, images of that um, publicly uh, at an event, and I saw them, and it, it's, it's dramatic. Um, it rendered her without many teeth and rendered her jaw immobile. Her first hand journey in recovering from the effects of dental trauma, led her to specialize her practice on the mouth-body connection. She loves to educate others on this topic and offers chairside coaching to help dentists implement the newest technologies, including salivary diagnostics and CAD CAM. She also founded a guided implementation surgical course for GPS and is a key opinion leader for Nobel BioCare, which has been featured on NBC News to, do, to, to discuss technologies to improve systemic health. And I believe she recently appeared on Fox News as well. And I will tell you, you'll be very interested to hear what's happening in her practice. That's really like, I, I just haven't seen anything like it. And that's why I flew down there on Monday and met with her hygienists and really got walked through what they're doing there. And I think you'll be really interested to hear what you could start doing today in your neighborhood. You don't have to be at UCLA or Columbia or Harvard uh, or, or a teaching hospital to start enacting some of these things that you're going to hear from Dr. Masley, uh, Ann Rice, and others. Um, Dr. McCann's going to explain how you can start doing some of that right where you are. And Ann Rice, a uh, huge fan of Ann Rice. She's been a guest on one of these, um, one of our prior panels where we talked about 
uh, the oral systemic link connected to heart health with Amy Donine. It was fabulous. And thank you for agreeing. She's given so much time to us. I really appreciate it. She's a graduate of Wichita State University and continued her studies and earned a bachelor's degree in oral health promotion. She's a graduate of the Bale Donine Preceptorship course for cardiovascular disease prevention for healthcare practitioners. You may have seen her as I have uh, all over the place speaking uh, for Bale Donine and the connectivity between heart health and uh, other systemic health. For over 30 years of clinical care, she found, um, or after over 30 years of clinical care, she found oral systemic seminars and is passionate about educating the community in all things oral systemic health and is focused on prevention strategies for dementia and those relationships in dentistry. She's a monthly contributor to today's RDH and has also written for Dentistry IQ, RDH Magazine, and Dental Entrepreneur Woman in 2020 and became a fellow with the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health, AOSH. She's a certified dementia practitioner and became certified as a brain longevity specialist with the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. So I think you will all agree that I am the least interesting person on the group, and yet I've done all the talking. So uh, with that, let me pivot over to Dr. Stephen Masley. Again, Dr. Masley, uh, my personal uh, appreciation for you being here. And could you set the table uh, for us um, with, with our topic today? Most appreciated. Well, yes, I'd really, I really, I think this is a very important topic. And let me just pull up and share my slides here so we can, I'll dive in. There we go. Hmm. Good. All right. So memory loss, you, when we think of memory loss, we think of dementia and 70% of that is Alzheimer's disease. And you know, it's pretty common. Six million people have this nationwide in the U.S. I'm um, up. And it is the most expensive disease that we deal with in the Western world. You know, our, we are over at over 200 billion annually for this. But what's really frightening is that the rates of Alzheimer's disease are projected to double over about a 12, 15 year period by 2030. And globally, this is, you know, it's going to triple by, uh, by 2050. So, I mean, right now we have, it's the most expensive disease, but considering it's going to double, I mean, that's really frightening. Now, the good news, I think, is that we have about a 20 year span that this occurs. And we really want to impact early because once your brain has shrunk like from a grape to a raisin and your brain has literally shrunk, it's, it's hard to deal with it. But we have like stage one, five years, no symptoms. But if you were doing testing on someone, you could see a slight gradual decline in cognitive function. Stage two is about 10 years. That's where people are more forgetful. They're not impaired. They're not disabled, but they're noticing it. And uh, probably their family members, maybe their coworkers are noticing that they're having decreased function. Stage three is called mild cognitive impairment. But I have to share with you, this is not mild impairment. This is they're on the verge of being disabled but they're not yet disabled. So they're, they are impaired. They probably would lose their job and not be able to function in many areas of capacity. And after about five years, if we, unless we make a significant change, almost all of them will progress to de full dementia, meaning they're fully disabled and unable to care for themselves. And I think what's so scary is at this point, they become a burden on the people they love. And none of us want to reach that point over this pr progression. So with long-term cognitive decline, you know, your brain's gradually shrinking. Um, and this, I think, helps explain why almost the 200 pharmaceutical drug therapies that up till now have been designed for Alzheimer's, none of them, I mean, the most recent drug is questionable, but of, of the 200 prior, None of them have been shown to actually stop cognitive decline and really make that difference. So that's an important distinction that up, we really don't have a proven therapy we can use except for lifestyle. That's been actually shown to be effective. 
the earliest signs of cognitive loss are short-term memory drops. You know, what did you have for breakfast? What did you hear in the meeting an hour ago with your team? Your reaction time slows down. You're not as quick as responding. And importantly for like the dental professionals is that you, it's harder to jump from one task to another. That shifting that occurs when someone interrupts you and you have to get back on task. And this is all occurring about 15 years before someone actually has dementia or Alzheimer's disease. There's lots of factors involved here. Um, insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar is number one, but your fitness is a factor. Cardiovascular disease is a factor. Nutrients is very powerful, and we'll come back to that. Toxins like mercury, lead, inorganic copper, nitrosamines that are in sandwich meats. Um, but importantly, inflammation is a very important risk factor, at which is like the, the second biggest cause of inflammation in the body is periodontal disease, gingivitis. That's what's really going to elevate CRP levels in a significant way. Um, other things we should at least be aware of are thyroid dysfunction, depression, a history of concussion, and some genetic factors that can predispose someone to memory loss, like an ApoE4 genotype that increases the risk by 300%. So it's multifactorial, but I think the inflammation part is one of the areas we can do a lot to help stop cognitive decline. As I said, insulin resistance, elevated blood sugar is the number one cause. So let's look at that and why that might be. That the combination of eating too many refined carbs with nutrient deficiency and inadequate exercise results in blood sugar levels gradually going up and more insulin being produced until the point where your insulin becomes, your cells are resistant to insulin. They stop listening. The fact that insulin levels keep getting pumped out by the pancreas, eventually once the cells are full of energy, they can't listen to that message to store more energy. And when you look at it like on a functional MRI scan of the brain, we can see that with insulin resistance, you can't get glucose into the cell and the glucose that's there is not being used and the brain cells start to become dysfunctional you get brain fog, and then the cells start to die and your brain starts to shift. So scientists have suggested that we could get rid of up to 60% of dementia if we could stop insulin resistance. So super important. Periodontal disease in the end part of insulin resistance is related to inflammation. The higher the inflammation, it raises your blood sugar and predisposes you to greater levels of insulin resistance. And there's actually studies been shown that if we could reverse periodontal disease, uh, and, and we would get, say, say we, from studies like 12 cohort and case control studies, if we could reduce periodontal disease from 20% of the population to just 10%, a 50% drop, we'd get rid of almost a million cases of dementia worldwide. So really, I think we can make a big difference in lowering inflammation that leads to insulin resistance and, and many other problems. Now, if we think about, you know, how are we going to confirm what we're going to, here's what is really the next important step, I think, from the dental community. We need prospective randomized interventions that have an intervention group, a control group to treat periodontal disease. And I, it should show a clear reduction in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So ideally, someone's going to come up, maybe one of you listening with a study that's going to assess this and we would be ass assessing cognitive performance pre and post therapy and show that we actually enhance cognitive therapy and help prevent cognitive decline with better dental care. Of the lifestyles that are really factors out there, as I mentioned, periodontal disease is important, but your fasting blood sugar level, these are when we've looked in our clinic at what predicts arterial plaque growth. And we've had hundreds of patients shrink their artery plaque by more than 10%. What predicts plaque shrinkage in your patients? It's fasting blood sugar, fitness, um, food intake, lower body fat, carotid IMT scores, nutrients, 
um, avoiding tobacco. All of these are important factors. But what's the, and I think we don't appreciate is that periodontal disease is probably as important as either avoiding tobacco or avoiding obesity. So it's really a big factor uh, along with these others that help predict cognitive um, decline in cognitive function. I'm, my favorite foods I would like you to encourage your patients to eat are gonna be green leafy vegetables, other vegetables, omega-3 rich seafood, um, like salmon, sardines, uh, mussels, clams, oysters, olive oil, and other healthy cooking oils like avocado oil, organic berries and cherries for their pigment. Similarly, the pigment that comes from the cocoa and dark chocolate. Also, the, the pigments that come from tea and coffee, red wine. Of course, red wine and tea and coffee have to be in moderation. Nut intakes are good for your brain. Spices and herbs, beans, and probiotics. Those are my tw top 12 foods that I wish you'd get your patients to eat more of. When it comes to nutrient needs, this is critically important. I'm really, I would like to see all the dental community, the hygienists, the dentists, quizzing their patients. Are you meeting your nutrient intake? From the work that we did analyzing arterial plaque age and plaque shrinkage or growth over time, Nutrient intake was more important than your cholesterol level. So it makes a big difference if we're getting these key nutrients like vitamin D, long chain omega-3 fats, a probiotic source, magnesium, and a multivitamin, especially for the B12, mixed folate, and zinc content that are in a multivitamin. Those are all really essential factors. And this, I think we should be quizzing our patients on every time they get up, they're making their, these, these key nutrients. So I think if we really wanted to make a big difference in our community in treating the scariest disease on the planet, the most expensive disease in the United States, and one that's going to double in the next five years, we want to add more brain supporting foods and avoid sugar that causes elevated blood sugar levels and insulin resistance. We need to meet brain nutrient needs. We want people to be active, to manage their stress, to avoid brain toxins. But optimizing oral health is an essential component if we're going to help prevent cognitive de decline and potentially enhance and improve cognitive performance. And we want to use as many of com the combination of these as possible, as the finger trial have showed. It, it, the combinate, when you get people to do multiple things, they're more likely to stick with it long term. So with that, I will stop sharing my, my slides. Awesome. Dr. Masley, I think everyone sees why I was so excited that you could spare the time to join us today. And again, he, Dr. Masley's staying on. Uh, we're going to have a vigorous Q&A session. I've seen a bunch of your questions and I appreciate it. Um, and, and anyway, Dr. Masley, that's not how I was going to do this, but a lot of the stuff you talked about, I hate to say it because I love this book. Literally, it's right here. You can see my desk. I got a bunch of stuff. There's nothing here but this book. Uh, a lot of it is right there. So I, if, if you, I'll, I'll hold it there for a second in case you want to see it. But um, we'll talk about slides and decks later. But I did want to, if you don't mind, Dr. Masley, that it's really helpful for folks. And I know people can take notes so fast and I uh, uh, love them to, to see it uh, at their leisure. And so uh, Anne Rice, uh, who has a huge following in uh, oral systemic community, brain health, and certainly in the world of hygienists, she's awesome. So um, and, and when we talk about this, of course, we talk about dental and sometimes we end up talking about dentists. And I think it's what Anne reminds us and lives and breathes. It's all dental professionals and hygienists have a massive role to play. Uh, so Anne, could you uh, take it from Dr. Masley? And now she's going to go in a, a little bit of even a deeper dive. So uh, grab your pens and get ready to take some great notes. Anne? Thanks. Following Dr. Masley is the most uh, scariest thing I think I've ever done in this whole speaking thing. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I can't talk about Alzheimer's disease without mentioning women. Two thirds of the cases are women. Um, don't fall for that myth that we live longer. We do live a, a short amount of time longer, but that's not where this falls. Our industry is also filled with women. So we have hundreds of thousands of hygienists and assistants. We have hopefully getting close to 100,000 dentists. I don't know that we're there yet. And then we have front office staff as well. So we could be a million. 
But more importantly is that half of our patients are women. So we have a propensity of a disease that is affecting our women. And I think we as healthcare providers really have to pay a little bit more attention to that. Women in their 60s are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease over the rest of their lives as they are breast cancer. And a 45 year old woman has a one in five chance to develop Alzheimer's disease as compared to a man that's at one in 10. Caregiving is a completely other hit. 10 million women currently are the unpaid care caregivers to loved ones with dementia. The horrible statistics of that is that they're six times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease themselves and they have a 60% chance of passing actually before the patient that they're caring for. I say most all of this because we have moms, we have sisters, we have loved ones, we have somebody in our lives and we can make a significant impact I think by doing simple steps and a little bit of education to impact their risk. So we're oral healthcare providers. We know that it doesn't stop there. We have assessments, we have treatments. We're also privy to medical information that impacts the patient's wellness. So it's not necessarily longevity that we're looking at. We're looking at a longer health span, pathogens, sleep, um, heart issues, smoking, insulin resistance, as Dr. Masley had talked about. A wealth of chances to help our patients drip a little bit of information to them to help have a better life. So I want to talk a little bit about the heart and how we can help our patients directly in heart health. And as Dr. Masley had talked about, arthrosclerosis and, and all that goes with that. So good heart health helps the brain. Blood flow to the head is a major predictor of brain health and function. Something as simple as reviewing a health history. So if I was to see AFib on a patient's health history, I'm going to tighten their recall schedule. They're on a three month maintenance with me because of inflammation. So I don't want a four millimeter pocket. I don't want inflammation. If you're not doing salivary diagnostics, you really don't have uh, a real key into what's happening um, with their pathogens. But uh, for AFib, there is a relationship between AFib and periodontal disease. We also know that um, the body's blood flow in and out of the brain, AFib affects that as well. So as I said, this isn't a cardiologist problem. This is our problem as well. And it's a great time to have a conversation with a cardiologist. Keeping with the heart, we know that blood pressure doubles your risk of Alzheimer's disease. I joke um, in that top slide, it's the wedding gift of the future. My niece didn't appreciate it when I gave it to her. Um, but this is probably going to ensure a longer, happier, healthier life um, for that couple. Older people with high blood pressure are more likely to have brain lesions. So that's areas of dead tissue caused by a low blood supply. This isn't just Alzheimer's disease. This is also vascular dementia as well. A study in JAMA Neurology found that blood pressure in midlife is key. Between 36 and 43, they had smaller brain volume at the end of the study, which is about at the age of 70. Women who had high blood pressure between um, in their 40s had a 73% increased risk of developing dementia later in their life. And if you have blood pressure high between 43 and 53, it is increasing your blood vessel damage around the age of 70. Taking blood pressure is standard of care, right? In dentistry, we can see subtle changes with our patients that could indicate systemic issues. The last thing in this is about homocysteine, which nobody ever thinks about, but it's a naturally occurring amino acid. And at high levels, it increases your risk of heart disease, stroke, hardening of the arteries and dementia. Well, you're not gonna pull a blood panel necessarily checking homocysteine, right? But you do do oral cancer screenings and you're in their mouth for an hour. We know that the relationship between homocysteine and lacking in B vitamins, you lack the vitamins, you increase the homocysteine. So pernicious anemia, when you see pale tissue, you see that on a health history. What Dr. Masley had talked about, getting into the diet discussion, they have anemia on their health history because those patients are two and a half times higher chance for Alzheimer's disease. Looking for angular cheilitis, glossitis, some of those key um, factors for a vitamin deficiency. Then we get into some of the scans that we do regularly. We know that five oral originating pathogens have been identified as causative in arthrosclerosis. We can do, Dr. Masley talked about a CIMT, which is a carotid uh, ultrasound screening. 
we are not diagnosing. Let's be clear here with all of these tests. We don't diagnose. This is just key information to refer them to a, a medical practitioner. But we can do these cardiovascular disease ultrasound screening scans in our practice. The top corner slide that you see, that's from Dr. Chris Kammer, who does this in his practice. So we can see stenosis. We could see that in the practice. When we're doing A1C testing now, chair side that we can do, um, we can even charge for it on our insurance. At that same time, when you get that little blood sample, you could do an inflammatory blood marker test checking for C-reactive protein. It's like taking the systemic inflammation temperature in the entire body. We also can do biophonic scanners checking for antioxidant levels. If you go to the Panorex x-ray, that's what you're gonna look for for a, a carotid calcification. So at that bifurcation, you can see that little lump. That Panorex on the bottom, a lot of you might look at that and think of all of the treatment that you can do. Well, I would hope that you would refer them to their doctor to make sure that they're going to make their seat date. You know that by seeing that, they're not getting adequate blood flow or oxygen to the brain. And lastly, um, a CBCT scan. I think it's imperative that we train everyone in the practice to look at our CBCTs. We're going to look for not just the major dental stuff, but we're going to look at landmarks. We're going to look at that carotid calcification on that CBCT assistants, hygienists, dentists, everybody needs to be trained. This is what we're talking about today. We talk about pathogens, right? Neuroinflammation, compelling active research has been going on regarding microbes, the immune system, and the oral cavity, and that interaction to inflammation. That is what's keeping periodontal disease at the forefront of systemic discussions. Inflammation causes neural damage from the cascade of events of the central nervous system, inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, 6, tumor necrosis factor. All of those interact with inflammation, increasing it in periodontal disease. We know about C-reactive protein limited in that. It's been reported that amyloid plaques, which is the hallmark for Alzheimer's disease, almost instantly forms around viruses and bacteria, and that infections, even mild ones, produce only minimal symptoms to you, but it fires up that immune system in the brain and leaving this debris trail, which is the hallmark for Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about pathogens, which we don't have a ton of time, but I'm gonna hit on some majors. Everybody has heard about the Porphyrmonas gingivalis study, uh, heard around the world a couple of years ago with they swabbed the little mice um, with uh, PG. Then there was a toxin called gingipanes that was secreted immediately getting um, amyloid plaques, so on and so forth. The lead researcher in that study was a Dr. Jan Potempa, and he is also studying uh, Tanarella forsythia, Prevotella intermedia. All of these are our pathogens that we deal with. Another pathogen, P Fusobacterium nucleatum, is implicated in all this as well. But one of the biggest things is spirochetes. Spirochetes are, spirochetes are neurotrophic in nature. Um, and there's been lots of research with this. It's been shown that in the gingival mucosa, a portal of entry for invasive spirochetes. They can transmit along the trigeminal nerve and ganglia. Spirochetes have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease for decades. Dr. Judith McGlossy has been looking at this for 30 years. She has met Hill's criteria for a causal relationship with spirochetes. If you do microscopes, you already know what I'm talking about, but you slap a sample on a slide for a patient, those spirochetes are moving like crazy, that they will do their periodontal treatment, I can uh, guarantee it. So there's this anti antimicrobial response hypothesis. So a virus bacteria prion is the root cause of Alzheimer's disease. The relationship between inflammation and Alzheimer's disease hallmarks have been long recognized with inflammation hypothesized to cause the tissue damage leading to those protein aggregates. Candida is something that we learned a couple years ago that it does cross the blood brain barrier. Pay attention to your patients that have yeast issues on their appliances, on their dentures, Invisalign, all of that, we need to treat it. And last, or second, lastly, I'm just going to go over HSV-1. Over 150 publications linking uh, herpes to Alzheimer's disease. You can see some of our leading researchers there on the left of your screen. And two of those is Dr. Rudy Tanzi and the late Dr. Robert Moore. And they have been studying Alzheimer's disease forever since the beginning of their careers. And Dr. Tanzi, as I heard him say, is that viral, bacterial, and 
fungal microbes may be seeding amyloid plaques. These viral infections bring on those plaques within, um, excuse me, 48 hours. So what do we do as a clinician? The very first thing you do, the patient says a cold sore on their health history and you're printing out the cyclovir prescription. I don't care if they're 20 and I don't care if they're 90. We need to stop the replication and do the best we can to stop that um, cold sore. We can look at ozone. We need to do more studies. We can start doing laser treatment more. We need to know about the prescription. There's a new prescription called Citivic. It's a little buckle patch you can put right up above, depending on the side um, that your cold sore is. And it really helps. Um, their results of their studies uh, are wonderful. And lastly, let me talk about sleep. Sleep removes brain toxins, specifically during slow wave sleep. Um, data across 30 years have found that short sleep, less than six hours, between the ages of 50 and 70 is associated with at least a 30% increase in dementia risk. That study suggested that persistent lack of sleep in midlife might be a key driver to dementia decades later. So there's lots of different, 18 million people have apnea, 25 million people have apnea, it depends on who you talk to. The point is if somebody in your practice has sleep apnea, this doesn't have anything to do with a mandibular advancement device, um, nothing. I like to use the example is you don't do molar endo, right, in your practice anymore. So if you see an abscess on number 19 on that periapical x-ray, you don't just put that in your pocket, shut the screen on your computer and then keep it to yourself, you refer them. Same thing, if you think that somebody has sleep disordered breathing, you refer them to somebody that can give them a sleep test if you're not doing it. Um, this isn't a heavy set uh, older man disease. Uh, almost 50% of postmenopausal women have apnea and women are nearly twice as likely to develop cognitive impairment from that. Sleep apnea does two things. It's interrupting your sleep and it's also dealing with your oxygen concentration in the blood, which is gonna drop and that adversely affects the brain. And the most vulnerable part of the brain for oxygen reduction is the hippocampus, where long-term memory is stored. With all of that, and as quickly as I could get through it, I want to share that successful healthcare is not just the management of disease. It has to do with prevention strategies, and we are prevention specialists. Something has to be done to spread this knowledge about preventive measures to slow down this rate of Alzheimer's disease. The utilization of us, we're a healthcare provider and partnerships in healthcare, dealing with unfortunately poor dental coverage that we, we really need to move forward. And universal education is key to making such a difference in this disease. And I'm gonna send this over to Dr. McCann. So I say a whole bunch of stuff and, oh my gosh, I can't do that in my practice. Are you kidding me? Dr. McCann does exactly that and she's going to share as soon as I quit talking um, about exactly how you do all this within the practice. Awesome. And thank you so much. And, and, and for all that you do. And that was, I was getting texts like, Oh my gosh. And a lot, a number of folks are privately chatting me, which is nice. Uh, just all the content that was there, everything from uh, women uh, concerns, health, particular concerns to others. And I think, what was remarkable is how many things you touched on that are related to oral health, you know, and, and sleep, and then yet how it all comes back to brain health and it all ties in together. So I agree with you. Then the question comes, Dr. McCann, okay, we've got, you know, a thousand people plus listening and a lot more people will watch the recording afterwards and they'll hear all this and they'll say, well, I can't do that. Only an academic institution or a large system hospital system or whatever, could could possibly start bringing oral systemic health into a neighborhood dental practice. And like I shared earlier, I was with you and the, and the team on Monday in Aurora, Colorado, and you're doing it. And uh, uh, I think people would be very, very interested to hear what are some of the things that you're doing in your practice and what kind of results are you getting? So Absolutely. That was such great information. I couldn't write fast enough. I was taking notes as quickly as I could. So I'm definitely going to have to go back um, and listen to this again. So thank you both, Dr. Masley and Ann, uh, for your great knowledge. So um, I have transitioned my practice. I've been open for about 11 years. And we have started uh, transitioning our practice over to a mouth-body connection clinic several years ago. Um, I was speaking at the Florida Dental Convention yesterday, and I shared 
um, a story about my uncle who ended up having a heart attack. And shortly after having a heart attack, his uh, cardiologist and functional medicine doctor sent him to me um, to start fixing his mouth. And he said if uh, the doctors told him if he had any shot of preventing a future heart attack, he needed to get in with me. Um, so oral health care is, is vitally important to the overall wellness of our patients. So implementing um, the mouth body connection into your practice is actually pretty simple to do. And what you first have to do is create a vision and a mission so that you can create that culture within your practice. Right when you walk into my office, it says that Aurora Modern Dentistry is the premier oral systemic health institute in Colorado. And I, I printed that out and I put it right when you walk in so that patients can see it, my staff can see it, so that everybody knows that we are different from every other dental office. Uh, Anne touched on this too, that your team members also have to be educated on what exactly is the mouth body connection and what are things that they can speak to to patients so that everyone is educated on how we can get our patients healthier. It's not just the responsibility of the dentist, it's not just the responsibility of the hygienist. Uh, your front office people, your dental assistants also need to be educated as well, because as we know as providers, uh, most of the time the patients don't ask us questions, right? They're usually asking our dental assistants and our front office team members about their treatment and how important it is. So make sure everyone on your team is educated. Um, I have a, a very strict and black and white clinical culture uh, protocol that everyone in my office is aware of and on board with. And the reason I do that is because I want to try and eliminate the gray area in my practice. So if, if patient X comes in and presents with Y, then we know that they get a very specific treatment. So if I have someone coming in with four millimeters and bleeding, we have a set protocol of treatment of what that patient's going to receive in the practice. So that way it really eliminates any kind of, um, you know, gray area or zones where, where people may say, oh, well, let's just watch that for six months. No, if we see this, we, we treat it uh, with this kind of package treatment in my practice. We also like to do several objective tests on our patients. We do a lot of salivary diagnostics, um, we do sleep studies, we do CBCTs, uh, bell scope exams, which I'll get into all of that later, because we want to track, re track results with our patients over time. So when someone comes in, we want to be able to show them over time how the bacteria in their mouth have improved. So that way patients know that what we're doing is legitimate and that they're actually getting real results. Um, it's always important to incorporate proven technologies into your practice, and I'll talk about some in a minute that are easy to incorporate right away. And then make sure that you're creating patient education tools so that your patients know that we are different. So like Dr. Masley and Anne alluded to earlier, nutrition is one of the, is one of the most vital things that we um, need to improve upon as a society. We, disease rates are going up at exponential rates and actually for the first time in our history, our life expectancy has gone down. And a lot of that is attributed to inflammation and that inflammation is uh, directly tied to the bacteria in our mouth and the food that we eat. So as oral health care providers, we can't just limit our discussions with patients on uh, bacteria and inflammation uh, for dental purposes. We also need to be educating them about nutrition. Um, my hygienists actually, they're, they're absolutely amazing. And I would invite any of you to my practice if you ever wanna come uh, meet with them. They really have taken, uh, taken this head on and they have an inflammatory uh, nutrition packet that's actually hanging up on the monitor in their room. So anytime that they start to notice that someone has uh, inflammation in their mouth, they pull this packet out and it literally just has pictures of foods, foods that cause inflammation and foods that reduce inflammation. So it's very easy for them to have that conversation with their patients on how they can get healthier. We also uh, have a, a, a document too about um, vitamins and minerals that people can be taking. Um, they also give patients oral probiotic samples um, just to try and get them starting to think about, hey, I need to improve my nutrition. I need to eat better foods. I need to also supplement the foods that I'm eating and I need to get my gut health um, in, in better shape. So find, find a passion leader on the team. Who's gonna drive the bus? 
So this is a picture of my office. I, uh, my benefits coordinator, and this is one of my hygienists, Cassie. I also have another fantastic hygienist, Jasmine, as well. Um, and it's, it's important that it's not just you driving the bus because I can't be in the practice every day and I can't see every single patient. So I really try and identify people on my team that are passionate about this topic and that can lead the team when I'm not around. Um, I found tremendous growth, tremendous success in empowering my hygienists. I, I love my hygiene team. They really are pushing this forward. And the reason why I lean on them for um, driving the mouth body connection is because they're seeing the patients every three to six months. You know, I, I see them for their six month checkup, but the patient is, is really coming in to see the hygienist. Sometimes we put them on two month recalls. You know, if someone has an interleukin six gene mutation and they're predisposed to inflammation, if they're a cardiac patient, um, if their salivary uh, tests come back and their levels are super high, we're probably putting them on a two month recall. So my hygienists are seeing the patients uh, more often than I am. So I really look to them to drive the mouth body connection. Their job is to detect inflammation, right? So if they're detecting inflammation, they're immediately having a nutrition conversation, they're having a bacterial conversation, um, they're talking about supplements and probiotics. They uh, are fortunate enough that they get to spend more time with the patients than I do. You know, when I come in, I usually have 10 other rooms that are waiting for me. So uh, when patients come in for their cleanings, they're spending, you know, anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour with my hygienist where they only get about 10 minutes with me. Um, they're in the mouth longer so they can directly look at things like airway. Airways is a big thing in our practice that we focus on as well because airway and airway health is vitally important to heart health and brain health. Um, my hygienists are the ones that drive the oral cancer screenings, the velscope screenings in my practice. They're also looking for signs of bruxism, for signs of erosion, um, and other symptoms that could be going on. And then again, always make sure that you're setting goals with your team. So it's not enough just to say, I want you to um, you know, focus on the mouth-body connection. We try and set goals, we try and track results, and then we, re we reward them when we see wins. And what I mean by wins, wins are when your patients are getting healthier. Wins are when your patients are still returning to the practice every two to three months for their maintenance. That's the wins that we that we're, we are after. So what are some useful services that you guys can offer in your practice? Um, my favorite that I, I, I really do um, all the time in my practice is the oral DNA and alert to saliva tests. So the alert to saliva tests, um, it's, it's two parts. So first part is a genetic profile where it's gonna detect mutations in the interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 genes. The reason why I want to know this is because I want to know if my patient is predisposed to inflammation. So if they have a mutation in one or both of these genes, then I know that any level of bacteria in the patient's mouth is going to set fire to their blood vessels. So I want to monitor those patients much more closely. I'll probably have them come in two to three months for recalls. If you combine that with a patient who already has heart issues, brain issues, diabetes issues, again, you wanna make sure that you are being much more aggressive and preventative in their treatment because we wanna keep their arteries nice and quiet. The other part of that oral DNA test is the bacterial test. So the mind perioath test, that's gonna give us the actual bacterial pathogens that are in their mouth. It'll tell you the level that they're present and then it'll tell you how it's affecting their overall health as well. So this is really important to show patients. So we get a saliva profile on almost all of our patients that come in. And then we wanna make sure that we're regularly retesting because a lot of um, these pathogens, six out of 11 that we test for, are actually very resistant to treatment. So a lot of people feel like once a patient comes in with a gum infection, we can treat it and it goes away. That's not the case because most of the bacteria, again, is resistant to treatment. A new test that we started doing in our practice is called the alpha MMP8 enzyme test. This is a, a really great test because this is chair side objective data to what's going on in the patient's mouth. So it's a little litmus paper test where you put these little strips into the periodontal pocket, you run it through a reader, and within five minutes, you'll get an objective number. So it's just like taking a cholesterol reading or a blood sugar reading. 
it will come out. It can be anywhere from 10 to, we've had numbers in the 300. Any number above 20 means the patient is currently losing gum and bone tissue around their mouth or in their mouth. So this is very, very important to show your patients, hey, you have active loss of gum and bone uh, tissue going on in your mouth and we need to treat this immediately. What's nice about this is oftentimes we can catch a patient that's having high enzyme levels before we actually start to see uh, clinically loss of gum and bone tissue. So we can intervene early and treat it. Velscope is, is vitally important in our practice. Uh, most oral cancers aren't detected until a later stage. And by the time they're detected, they're oftentimes very difficult to treat and the mortality rate is really high. So we, my hygienists are the ones that are doing the Velscope screenings in my practice. And then you can also follow that up by doing HPV saliva tests for your patients as well. We have one patient in our practice, he's been with us for about 10 years, and unfortunately he was diagnosed with stage four pharyngeal cancer that was related to HPV. So he's undergoing um, you know, a whole bunch of treatment right now to try and get it under control. And so when his wife came in recently, we did an HPV test on her to see if uh, she had the same virus. And luckily hers came back negative. So it was really nice to be able to, to provide that service to our patient. Again, nutrition counseling for lowering inflammation. This is so easy to do and it only takes a couple minutes. Again, we have a, a paper that has pictures of good foods and pictures of bad foods. You can take the, uh, the information from Dr. Masley's slides, find pictures of those foods and just put it on a laminated uh, piece of paper for your patients. Oral probiotics, these are, are vitally important. We have so many more bacteria in our gut than cells in our body. And if our gut health is not in good shape, the rest of our body will not be in good shape either. So a key to controlling oral inflammation is to have a healthy gut. So don't forget about those probiotics. Um, sleep is vitally important. Um, we offer home sleep tests in our practice. And 80% of people who have sleep apnea are actually undiagnosed. Um, like Ann said, most uh, postmenopausal women have sleep apnea. So it's not just the overweight or big muscular guy, you know, that doesn't have a, a long neck. It's, it's usually tiny, you know, skinny postmenopausal women that we're finding in our practice that have sleep apnea. So anyone that is bruxing their teeth, if they have um, acid erosion on their teeth, they're not sleeping well, class two occlusion, missing, you know, premolars from ortho, we need to be looking at those uh, patients and testing them for sleep. And then a big one in our practice, um, I'm a, a big believer in CAD CAM dentistry. Um, I like to get amalgam fillings out of the mouth. Um, we know mercury is not good for the brain, as Dr. Masley said, it's not good for the gut, it's not good for serotonin. So we wanna remove amalgam fillings and we choose to replace um, the amalgam fillings with porcelain restorations using CAD CAM. So how can you start? You know, it's, it's Friday, how do we start this on Monday? The first thing I would encourage you guys to do is just take the extra five to 10 minutes and get a complete dental, medical, social, and family histories. Most of our patients come in and they say they have no health issues. However, if you're seeing a patient in their 20 or 30s, like we mentioned earlier, most of these disease processes take years to develop. You know, you have um, a period of, of five to 10 years before you even start seeing signs of cognitive decline. There's, it takes 10 years of insulin resistance to build up before you have a diagnosis of diabetes. So just because someone doesn't have medical problems now doesn't mean that they won't have them in the future. So make sure you're asking the question about their family members. So I'll say, do you have any uh, heart issues or any issues with diabetes? And oftentimes I hear no. The next question I ask is, okay, well, tell me about your parents. Tell me about your grandparents. And you'll start to really uncover that a lot of these issues are present in people's families. Make sure we are screening for OSA, for oral or obstructive sleep apnea. We are in the mouth. We have access to look at the airway. If you look in someone's mouth and you can't see past their tongue to the throat, we need to be thinking about doing a home sleep test. There's also questionnaires that patients can fill out while they're sitting in their chair waiting for the exam that will tell you if they're high risk for, for having sleep apnea. 
you know, for the dentists on the call, be very aware of giving your Bruxer patients night guards. If you give a patient a night guard for brushing their teeth and they have sleep apnea, what you're doing is you're actually reducing the oral space for their tongue and you're making the sleep apnea worse. This was very alarming to me because in before I started testing for sleep apnea, night guards were, were a very common thing that I would prescribe in my practice. I went back and started testing those patients for sleep apnea and they all had sleep apnea. So make sure that if you can't test for uh, sleep apnea in your practice, that you're giving a, a referral to the patient's physician to test for it. Um, this is uh, probably the second thing I would encourage you guys to do after doing complete medical and dental histories on all your patients is probe every patient, every cleaning. So when I graduated 11 years ago, I would probe my healthy patients once a year and I would probe my perio maintenance patients every three months. Well, what I started to notice over time was that I would have healthy patients at, at one visit and then a year later, they would actually have gum and bone loss around their teeth. So what happened during that 12 month span that I didn't catch? So I tell my patients, my job is to prevent disease. I am a conservative practitioner. I intervene early and I prevent disease. So instead of waiting 12 months to check my patient again, I want to check them every single time they come in because we know that health can change in a matter of three months. So, so in my practice, every time someone comes in, they get probed uh, every time they, they are seeing us for a cleaning. And make sure we're probing teenagers as well, right? As soon as that patient has their full adult dentition, we need to start probing. When just from looking at saliva tests across my practice, parents who have periodontal disease oftentimes have the same bacterial profile as their kids. The gum and bone destruction just hasn't happened yet. So make sure you're getting saliva panels on families. Make sure we're, we're uh, examining uh, teenagers. Make sure we're intervening early to prevent them from getting gum disease. I like to take baseline MMP8 and alert 2 screening on all my patients because I want to see what the genetic profile is so that I can better tailor their treatment for long-term success. We do our Bellscope screenings at least once a year, and we just call it our yearly cancer exam. And again, this is driven by the hygienist in my practice. If they see something abnormal, they'll come grab me right away to double check, but we just incorporate it. Once a year, patients get their yearly cancer screening. And then I would really start to encourage you to, to eliminate metal from your practice. Um, I, I don't take out all amalgam fillings every time. You know, I try and wait to see when they do need to be changed. And then if we do need to eliminate them, we use things like dry shield, something to take the aerosols and to protect the patient, and protect us as well. Um, but everything that we deliver in our practice is metal free. And then make sure that you're communicating all of the results of the tests that you're taking in your practice to the patient's primary health care provider. Um, a lot of doctors aren't necessarily um, on board yet with the mouth body connection, but it's our job as oral health care providers to start educating them so that they know that oral health is vital to, to helping them manage their patient's uh, systemic diseases. So make sure you're sending the sleep results to the doctor. Make sure you're sending the saliva results. So if you have someone in your practice that has arrhythmia, high blood pressure, history of stroke, history of heart attack, you should be getting the alert two panel on them, figure out what bacteria is in their mouth and if it's affecting their heart or their brain um, and sending those results over to the healthcare provider. Let them know what you're doing in your practice to help, help make their patients healthier. Awesome. Dr. McCann Lee, thank you so much. And for all the panelists, we have been peppered with questions, which is awesome. Uh, some have been public. So if anyone's following the chat, they've seen a bunch and some have been sent uh, privately. So I have a whole list if that's okay. Uh, so some quick ones, uh, just to knock off. I, again, I was in Aurora, Colorado on Monday and some had asked what those uh, supplements uh, are being given. And, and I took a packet because I was curious. This is not a product plug, everybody, not a product plug. Dr. McCann can explain. She just did her own research and found them and, and, and gives out samples, but that's what it looks like. It says hyper, I'm reading it backwards. You know how this all works. Hyperbiotics pro dental. Uh, again, I, I have no idea. I'm not plugging it. I'm just saying it's been asked a, a few times of what it is. Um, so, and the other one that, that I will jump on quick, if that's okay, is AM, AMMP8. 
uh, that Dr. McCann mentioned a few times. That is probably new to most folks, uh, unless you've really been following academic studies, uh, which for a number of years uh, show AMP8 is a biomarker that indicates collagen breakdown in the mouth, uh, which can indicate obviously periodontal disease. And it, uh, the reason it's very popular right now in Europe and growing exponentially there, and it's starting to come to the US, is that obviously uh, dental clinicians like uh, uh, Dr. McCann find it very educational for patients, uh, but certainly believe that it can help indicate far earlier than one can see in traditional 2D radiography, bone loss and such things like that. And for patients, it's it, we believe it'll be helpful um, because you can actually almost like gamify, like you can actually see your score and hopefully go down when you have good practices, which is great. So the reason I share all that with you is because I happen to know right now, people have asked, where can I get it? Um, the perio fitness test right now in the U.S. is only available under it, with, with certain uh, folks. It's in academic institutions. Uh, Dr. McCann is only, I don't know, maybe one of five or ten practices uh, in the United States who's also testing it um, and, and, and giving her feedback on the test. I will share with you, I don't know, but I won't be surprised if in 2022 it is ubiquitous and available. And then just in case you're curious, I took a test. I thought, I thought in case you want to see it. Um, so this comes back with the AMP8 level. They print it out right there. It gives me all this information. Um, it's really at this point about patient information rather than like say a pure diagnostic tool. And I'm not going to share with you what my grade, what my score was because I had it taken before COVID. And I was so proud of myself. I was like, you know, I got this. You know, I can tell people I work in the dental world and, and I feel proud of it. But I'm not going to show you what it is now because anyway, let's just say I need to get back to my hygienist. I haven't seen her in, in too long. So anyway, that's AMP8. Um, and so, we, gosh, we have so many topics. So let me jump in uh, with one of the first ones, which was about patient health history. Like, hey, how do we start when they come into dental practice, which many patients go to the dentist and hygienist more often than they see a primary care physician. So what are the types of questions and health histories and, and what do we think about that? And, and, and uh, I'm gonna throw up a suggestion and then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to, to the panelists. Uh, for instance, you know, Dr. Massey, what, do you, what would you like to see your patients be asked when they go to the dentist and things? One is just a suggestion, diabetes. Um, that's not today's core subject, but of course, oral systemic health. There is a pre-diabetes, diabetes risk test that is uh, been provided by the American Diabetes Association and the CDC. And it just asks some real simple questions. Uh, this could be part of a patient intake form because you're probably seeing, probably I'm underselling it, you are seeing patients who are pre-diabetic every day. And if you could help them know this, it would also put into context what you're seeing in the mouth, which may have a greater urgency uh, there. But that's just one example that maybe, to, you know, maybe oral health care, we need to start thinking about ourselves as as wanting to receive this information and knowing that, that it can help us with diagnosis and care. So Dr. Masley, and by the way, y'all are, you can all speak whenever you feel like speaking, but Dr. Masley, just an open question to you. What are some of the questions that time permitting and able to intake that information that you'd love to know that your patients were being asked when they went into to a dental practice? Well, from a family health perspective, I, I, the top three for me would be a family history of cardiovascular disease, memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, or diabetes. Because I think that's where when we think of oral systemic health, it's going to make the biggest difference for them. So really, I would focus I mean, cancer, other things, of course, but those would be the top three I would focus on. And I mean, from a health history, I really like to know I mean, I, I focus on, do you eat, do you exercise, do you meet your nutrient needs? Those are my top three goals because that's where I can make a difference. You know, do they have a, a personal history of hypertension, elevated blood sugar, cardiovascular disease, mem memory loss? Any of those things are really important. But my focus is on diet, nutrient and activity. That's where I put my efforts. That's great. Appreciate it. And how, uh, for yourself, are there things that you ask a patient or talk to a patient about that you think it, it, it may, may be ahead of the curve as far as uh, what's happening? Um, I don't necessarily, I don't, all of the probing questions, you know, our health histories, 
are getting longer and longer, right? And then the, which are all necessary information, which is more obviously irritating um, to the patient and very open-ended questions when you get them in the operatory. Whether they're checking boxes is one thing, but I mean, if you're hitting in one area, and like I said, the open-ended questions where you're gonna get a whole lot of data leading them into a conversation. So um, lots of different things now to think about. Um, family history, of course, that Dr. Masley talked about, and we know that relationship is so important. Um, I don't know that we've ever asked on a health history, and Dr. McCann may have it at her practice, but do we ever ask the question, does anybody in your family have a history of periodontal disease? Because, I mean, she, may, she you're nodding your head, so you may have that. But I think that's an important question for a multitude of reasons, how they were raised, what the priorities are, what is, you know, any of that genetic. I think that's an important thing to always have on a, on a health history as well. Great. You know, Dr. McCann, let me uh, ask you, and, and, and I know Ann served something up there as well, but I, I'm curious how patients receive this. You know, there I am in Aurora, Colorado. I sit down, I say to uh, Jasmine and Cassie, all right, take me through the protocol. I want to see what you're really doing. And Dr. Mazzi, they hand me while I'm, they, oh, when I'm having to go out to get something. Well, hey, take a look at this. I'd like you to review it. And it started with nutrition. And I wish I had, I have really bad photos of it because I, you know, want to take pictures of it, but it was started with nutrition and foods and what are you eating and this and that and, and all that. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, and Dr. Mazzi, you would have cheered, but doc, Dr. McCann, I've never had that happen before. Mm -hmm. Right. I've been working in, in dentistry for more than, more than a decade. And, and I work at Pacific Dental Services. We, we support more than 600 plus owner dentists and not, over 850 practices in the U.S. I've never seen that. What do patients think? You know, how do they react to all this? Yeah, so it's it's not for everybody, right? And I and I try and tell my team that we, you know, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, right? So I try and, and coach them that not every patient is going to be on board for this right now. Sometimes it can be a slow burn for patients because the integration of oral systemic health and that knowledge is not really uh, mainstream yet. So we have some patients that are all about it. And when they check into the front desk, they say, I'm here to check my fours. I want to get laser today. I need to redo my saliva test. And we have other patients that sit down and they're like, my gums have always bled my entire life. I don't care. So our job is to figure out where the patient is at in their healthcare journey and meet them there and slowly start to educate them over to, you know, different ways that they can affect their, their overall wellness. We tell them 80% of your health, your oral health and your systemic health is taken care of by what you do outside of this office. We only have about a 20% impact. So if, if we can slowly start to titrate some information to them and over time they can change, for me, that's a win. Um, other things that I've noticed, we started transitioning to medical software in one of my practices. And it's amazing to me when I compare the health histories that are taken at the doctor's office to the health histories that my long-term patients have disclosed to me, they're wildly different. I had one patient who only has disclosed for eight years that she was on blood pressure medication and cholesterol medication. Yet when we brought in her my chart, her medical record, she had sleep apnea that was untreated, which by the way, she also bruxed, bruxed her teeth and had acid reflux. She had arrhythmia. Uh, she did have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. She also had a history of HPV and cervical cancer and it never told us that. And yet here we are trying to do oral cancer screenings in our practice and she kept declining them. So having that, you know, as soon as we can get access to patients' medical records, I really think we're going to see um, the overall care that we give our patients really improve. Yeah. And, and I will just give an optimistic view of the future because um, we, we're, uh, we're going to pivot towards some of the barriers that we currently deal with uh, in dentistry and medical. How do we work together? And this is, it, it, the purpose of today is to talk about not just, hey, how can we work together now, but also champion what, what identify and champion uh, how we can overcome some of the hurdles that are still in front of us. And I will say on an optimistic note, 
um, I'll share with you, uh, I'm often asked to speak about this, is Pacific Dental Services, where I obviously am the Chief Enterprise Strategy Officer. Um, we are the Vanguard partner for Epic, which is the largest uh, dental practice, excuse me, medical practice management electronic health record system in the world. Uh, and we're their Vanguard partner for dental, similar as CVS was for pharmacy. Uh, you all may know CVS, Health Hubs, all the rest is on Epic, as is Walgreens now and others. So for most Americans, now their, their prescriptions are all immediately accessible is part of my chart, which is the one record. And as Dr. McCann, what she was alluding to is now dental is part of that. Now, I'm not trying to say that, that this is going to be the solution for everybody right away, because right now we're just rolling it out. It will be by the end of the year, I think 600 of the 850 practices uh, that we work with will be on Epic. And by the end of the year, by the first quarter next year, we'll finish out. So it's it's a unique case. And I do recognize that. But I can tell you optimistically how um, and, and this is my cheering for anyone who's in the public policy world and the in the, in the in the public health world we need to continue to champion the the immediate and easily commingling of data uh, because what we're seeing i'll share with you we first deployed in uh, in the inland empire in california in southern california and we did it in april 1st as our first practice and if you remember there was something going on with with a small little pandemic you might have heard of and so we started rolling it out there because things were very quiet right and what we found was within months, like a short amount of months, just in the Empire, Kaiser, which is also on Epic, uh, they started pulling medical uh, oral health records at 10 times what we in Epic predicted they would after we had all informed Kaiser that, hey, by the way, this patient population, a good number of them now have their oral health records going into Epic that you'll have access to. We didn't expect any to get pulled, candidly, because nobody told Kaiser. Epic didn't tell them. Nobody told the case management teams uh, at Kaiser who are doing diabetics or those with dementia or Alzheimer's no, or cardiovascular. Nobody told them. But more than 10x, they started pulling the oral health records to give a more complete uh, treatment plan to their, to their patients. So there's cause for hope here. So it's a two way street. So when Dr. McCann talks about the benefits that she sees about be seeing their medical records right there and it can start treating her patient more holistically, it's dare I say doubly so on the medical side. And I say that um, not to brag about PDS because we, you know, not every dental practice can invest a hundred million dollars. Yeah. hundred million bucks. You heard me that we're investing over a great number of years to be able to do this. Most can't do that. But let me tell you, when when it becomes more ubiquitous, we're just the first ones. We won't be the last. It's going to come. When we have this shared data set, it will be uh, great uh, for everybody. So um, barriers to us working together um, is, and sorry, Nancy, I wasted your time with that. Anyway, uh, hilarious. So, uh, so what are some of the other barriers here? I'd like to talk to you about education you know, hygienists, MDs, dentists. Is this something that was talked about? You know, how, say, with whether it's brain health or systemic health, was this something that was part of your curriculum? You know, is, is this new? I mean, do, is this something that we can expect graduates coming out of, of hygiene school, medical school, dental school to have some facility? Well, for medical school, I would say they're not getting nutrition information. That's not part of the curriculum. In only a small way is that even being mentioned. And I don't, and I don't, I don't believe they're hearing much of, I, I didn't get anything on dental, even as important as it is to overall health when I was in medical school. So I think that's a big opportunity and a change that should be occurring. But I think it's an opportunity for the dental community to step up and provide more information because people are in desperate need of it. And it would make a difference. And there was, I saw a question here on the chat list about supplements, about whether they're absorbed and whether they're useless or not. But even one of the worst one a day commonly sold supplements out there has been shown to, if people took a, a poor quality one a day that I would not recommend daily, that they would decrease cancer rates in a significant big way. Um, so yes, I want to just shout out and answer that question that uh, taking a supplement will make a big difference. And it's up to us to provide that educational message that it's worthwhile and better quality uh, 
nutrients would really be worthwhile. Awesome. And, and I'll give a quick shout out to University of Pacific, to Harvard, uh, to NYU, to Columbia. They are actually already or rolling out curriculum where first year dental students sit uh, next to first year medical students and they're actually learning together. And uh, a couple of them, including UAP, uh, ha are building out shared clinics. So when they actually go in, uh, in uh, before they graduate to actually work and see patients, they're actually starting to work shoulder to shoulder. So uh, really cool. And uh, someone else giving a shout out to uh, UT Health at San Antonio is also uh, doing the same, which is really cool. Um, so, Anne, how about you? Do you, as far as hygiene, any, any, because we have some academic. I, well, and I've and read through all of this chat and it comes up all the time is like, how we don't have time to do all this. That's the first thing. And then how are we going to learn about all of it? So it's, you can get a continuing ed here. You can get a continuing ed there. But I mean, this goes back to policy and Dan and I, you and I have, been in this. Um, it, it's policy change, which is a grand idea. Um, it, policy change has to happen in all of our educations, in dental school, in hygiene school, and in medical school. Um, you know, dentistry needs to get a universal approach, even though the ADHA has now, or the ADA now has said about oral systemic health, you know, they had letters to the editor within the last few years that it's, um, they weren't exactly on board with it. So we have to get a consensus. Then we have to do some redirection in our education. We can't expect clinicians to get it, you know, a little education here and a little education there. Um, it's all over the place. So there has to be some policies. Um, this There isn't a quick answer. So there has to be policy change in getting benefits there has to be in the education part um, for all of our groups and then this collaboration um, we're not going to get 100 percent agreements but a, a collaboration um, between the two i, I do want to to say this because as a hygienist you know dr mccann is working this in her practice and she's very unique um, i would love it if there was a possibility for a hygienist to be hired in a practice, not pulling out a scaler, a the liaison person, the testing person, the educating person, the calling the cardiologist person, the doing the whole thing um, and not necessarily doing the scaling part. Then in turn, I would love to see hygienists having the ability to work in a cardiologist practice. What if what if a cardiologist decides to do salivary diagnostics, Dr. Brad Bale and Amy Donine? And then we get this thing back and forth with the dental providers to treat the disease. Um, there's so much of that that really has to, and I don't have the answer of how that's going to work, but it's really something that we have to start driving um, some sort of, of change in that. So... Appreciate I went off it. the rails. No, no, that's you're right in the rails. Actually, appreciate it. Um, hey, Dan, I'd like to yeah. chime in here too. Um, you know, education and our and our healthcare education that we receive is challenging. And I can say, you know, even the dentists coming out, um, oftentimes, you know, there's only four years of dental school, and so just learning the basics of dentistry, I feel like it is hard to even get that in, in, in four years. And so I, I do think that as healthcare providers, we are professionals. We also have to take initiative to start looking at these things and doing research on our own and educating ourselves. I do a ton of reading. I read Dr. Masley's book. I read Beat the Heart Attack Gene by uh, Dr. Bale and Amy Donine, you know, back in 2012. So you know, I challenge everyone on the call to spend your free time educating yourselves um, in our profession because it's what, you know, the information I have today and what I know today is, is vastly different from what I knew 11 years ago. And the field is changing so quickly and the research that's coming out is evolving so rapidly, we have to stay on top of it. Um, and then to the, to the questions that I'm, you know, seeing on there, how can a hygienist possibly do this for their recall patients? Um, my hygienist, again, I didn't invite anyone to my practice. So my hygienist see about eight patients a day. 
Um, they have our appointments on their schedule, but I'll tell you, they oftentimes only get about 30 minutes. Um, they do not work with assistants. However, the assistants in our practice do help them with, you know, polish and gloss and x-rays and things like that. But once you get really well versed on things on um, this topic, it really doesn't take that much time to have these conversations and run these tests with the patient. Uh, everyone on my front office is trained to perform a saliva test. So if we order a saliva test, it's not the hygienist who's usually administrating it. It's usually my benefits coordinator after the case is accepted. You know, our assistants will come in and do the polish and floss and the x-rays. And so the, the hygienist can come in and give all the information and do a proper cleaning, you know, with just 30, 45 minutes of time. You know, obviously, if the patient's getting scaling root cleaning, that's going to take much, much more time. But, you know, try and think of ways that you can increase efficiencies in your practice so that your hygienists have this amount of time to, to treat their patients. That's great. You know, a couple quick ones I want to make sure we get to. Uh, one is cost. So a number of folks asked, they heard about all the testing that's being done and oral DNA, and a lot of it's not covered by insurance. And some have made some comments to say, hey, it seems like the dental insurance world is, is a barrier to this. So wondering, you know, if you could comment on that, Dr. McCann, and then if time permitting, I'd love Dr. Masley and, and, and uh, we've had some questions that are really personal and specific about dementia and, and um, you know, I don't really care if it's that connected to oral care, but but I'd love to get in those a uh, couple quick ones if we could. So, Dr. McCann, on cost, what you know, give us a sense of you know oral DNA and costs and and how patients you know are you getting insurance to pay for any of this and or is it a yeah? Choice? So um, most of this is out of pocket for the patients. Um, you know, there are some dental insurances that are starting to cover oral DNA um, testing. There's some that are starting to cover Bellscope. You know, hopefully with the whole medical dental integration, you know, healthcare system of one, hopefully we'll see more of this get covered. But I always tell my providers and my office staff that insurance does not dictate the quality of care that I provide in my practice, right? So it's my obligation to present the best dentistry possible to each and every patient. It's then up to the patient to decide what works best for them. So I have this whole toolbox of tests and services that I can offer the patient. And most of my patients can't afford all of this. You know, the average income of the, the area that I work in is $22,000. That's it. But yet my hygienists are still doing a multitude of tests on patients because number one, they're conveying the importance to the patient of how this is gonna help set them up for long-term success. So most of the time it's not covered, it is out of pocket, and some patients you know, want this elevated level of care and other patients do not. But I, I don't let insurance dictate the quality of care that I, off, that I at least offer patients. Yeah, I, I will share that uh, we regularly do speak to some of the larger insurance companies and those who have offer both medical and dental seem to be the ones who haven't yet, but will be the prime movers because there's general acceptance to, to Dr. McCann's point uh, that if they have patients with systemic conditions where they're most expensive members, obviously, if they recognize if they can drive them to uh, dental care, periodontal disease treatment, that they save money on the medical. So, you know, I hope that dental insurance comes along, but for them, it, it, it might take a little longer because they see, maybe see it more as, hey, uh, it's just expense to me, and where do I see the savings if I'm paying for SRPs um, for this in this circumstance, versus if you go to the medical insurance companies, you can all Google it. They're published studies. Blue Cross Blue Shield has published a number of studies. Aetna has, United has. They all say, and they see it, we'll save a tremendous amount of money if we can get these patients, our medical members to dental. So um, again, not to be Pollyannish, but I, I do think optimism is realistic. And with our technologies coming out like 3D imaging, where I know Dr. McCann, you're uh, regularly using CBCT uh, with salivary diagnostics, you know, these do um, help a lot. And in fact, let me ask a quick question, Dr. McCann, even if in, say dental insurance doesn't pay for a salivary diagnostic, test, is it useful to send it to them at times to show why a procedure was necessary? Yeah. So we get a lot of um, insurance denials. You know, if we see four millimeter pockets and bone loss and bleeding, we're going to do scaling and root cleaning. But a lot of dental insurances haven't moved to covering that. A lot of dental insurances will only cover scaling and root cleaning at five millimeters and bone loss. 
So oftentimes we'll send in their salivary di diagnostic uh, test results and they're covered immediately. Um, right. Same with pregnant patients. If pregnant people come in and they don't want x-rays, insurance isn't going to cover perio treatment on them. So we'll do a saliva test and send that in so that they uh, get their perio benefits. Great. And people are asking about the CE code. It's been posted. I'm sure it could be posted again or, or Jed, you can let people know. So if you don't mind, Dr. Masley, and I know you certainly work in the field as well. Um, you know, we were asked a question uh, by somebody and I got pinged by a couple of folks who are listening and they're listening really for themselves or loved ones. How does one tell the difference between, say, call it dementia and just, quote unquote, aging, memory, degradation, et cetera? Is any quick well, memory on? loss is not a sign of normal aging. You should maintain your memory and cognitive function into your 90s. So if it's if it's going sooner, that's not aging. That's a disease that's largely preventable. Just getting rid of insulin resistance would get rid of 60 percent of dementia. When you add the other things that Ann and Dr. McCain and I are talking about, I think we can prevent 80 to 90 percent of memory loss and you shouldn't deal with it. So I, I think there is a myth that cognitive decline is a normal part of aging. And I absolutely do not agree with that. Yeah. And any commentary there? I wanted to mention because he's Dr. Masley is talking about um, uh uh, diabetes and insulin resistance and all, and all that kind of thing. And really to try to move that more forward in dentistry, you know, so many people don't go to the doctor and getting an A1C assessment. I, like I said, we're not diagnosing this. They got to go to a doctor, right? But getting those markers so simply in a dental practice can really, in this pre-diabetes situation, you don't want to be a pre-diabetic. And how many times does that happen? Oh, they said I was a pre-diabetic. And then they sit with that for 10 years because they're going to diet it down. They're going to lose the weight. They're going to. No, it's like watching decay grow. Right. So we don't this. We need to head off these pre-diabetic patients and we can do that a lot um, really easily in our practice. And OK, so they don't want to do it in the practice. Recommend that they can go to the CVSs and the Walgreens for a very minimal amount and get their A1C tested. It is not expensive. You can also do it yourself. You have to, you don't have to be super smart, but there's a couple of things to do when you test yourself. Um, I think that's something we need to move forward. I mean, we talk about sugar all the time because of decay. Um, we need to talk about it in this world as well. Great. So um, thank you very much. So I'd like to just thank a couple of people and then turn to the panelists uh, just for any final commentary or, or either something that sparked with you or a comment, uh, if you'd like to make it. Uh, and also you can see the verification code. Thank you. And I think uh, there may be a screen also. Uh, people have been asking for social media handles for our panelists, so appreciate it. So quick thank you, obviously, Crestor will be for sponsoring this. Really appreciate their support for the entire series. Uh, it's been uh, excellent. Jed Ivy, a lot of you who come on CE Zoom and Crestor will be uh, seminars or webinars know who Jed is. Thanks, Jed. Appreciate all your work behind the scenes. And uh, Laura Dildy of NDA Media and Katie Rada. Thank you for producing all of this. And of course, to our panelists, uh, you are a remarkably busy people uh, helping uh, uh, patients every day. So thank you for taking time uh, to be with us today. So if all right, let me kick it over to the panelists to see if uh, uh, you have a closing remark or comment. We'd be happy to hear it. Dr. Masley, if I could start with you. I'd like to follow up on Anne's point that she just made that, you know, if blood sugar is the number one cause for decay, Clearly, that's part of the dental community activity that they should be involved in. But sugar intake is the number one cause for heart disease, the number one cause for hypertension, and the number one cause for memory loss. So I think the dental community is ideally situated to deal with the number one threat to health today, and that has to do with sugar. So focus on it. Don't, don't, you know, look at the systemic impacts that go beyond the mouth. And I think you are ideally situated to make that difference and that huge impact on the health of your patients and your community.
So that I, I again, I'll go back to I like to focus on what we eat, <laughs> our nutrient intake, our activity. I like measuring inflammation. I love that we heard before about measuring CRP levels. And when you see gingivitis, that's an opportunity to think of a high sensitivity CRP test because inflammation is probably one of the number one causes for avoidable and preventable aging that we see today. So I think you're playing a critical role and you've got a big opportunity to make a huge difference in people's whole overall health. So awesome. thank you very much for inviting me. And it's really been a pleasure to participate with no, these other excellent people. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And? Um, I don't, you know, there's so much to it. And of course, I, if anybody knows me, you know how I've been doing the healthcare, you know, beating the drum that we're healthcare providers and all the rest. I encourage everyone to explore all the different avenues out there. We have academies of oral systemic health. We have the Santa Fe group that's really trying to change some policies. Um, Frontiers right now has a journal. It's not all done, but it's about transdisciplinary science and oral and systemic health where you get a bunch of authors writing this together. How are we going to really do this? But the, the first step that we do today before we change policy and change the world is um, educating, educating our patients. That's the primary, that's what we're doing. That, and that's our primary target, educating each other. You're at a dinner party and you've got a doctor there or somebody else. Don't poo poo the industry, bring up the value. This is what we do and all of the things that we can do. Um, and it's the collaboration part. It's having those conversations. Got to start there. Great. Dr. McCann. Yeah. I would just say that, you know, this is something that we can start to do immediately and it doesn't take a lot of effort or overhead or a complete revamp of the practice. You know, just start by focusing on asking more intentional health history questions. Talk to your patients about nutrition and probe every patient every time. If you just implement those three things starting Monday, you'll be able to start to transition your practice over to a mouth body connection clinic. So don't overthink it. Uh, take slow steps and start to implement things that are easy that you can do on day one. Awesome. So uh, hopefully you've all seen the code out there. We've posted it up and down. I, I think it's, uh, I don't remember, PDS625. So if you look up on one of the boxes, the one who doesn't have a human head in red, PDS625. So thank you everybody for attending. Thanks for all the comments. It gives great energy and participation. And I know the panelists really enjoy engaging with you. We're all super tired of, CE, of Zoom and everything else, right? So the engagement here is really, really appreciated. So thank you everybody and uh, have a great day and a great weekend. Thanks again to our panelists. Cheers everybody. Thanks.